This is the story of the ending of a civilization, of the breaking of a way of life, the story of a nation facing extinction and of the choices that its people made. The story of the ending of the Empire of Byzantium and of the beginnings of the modern world. The last years of the Empire of Byzantium were filled with stress and beauty. Faced with enemies, looking for friends, and always waiting for the ending. As it fell, Byzantium's ornaments, its arts and peoples, settled on the west like sparks from a burning forest. Sparks that lit the Western world. I'm standing high above the Golden Horn in Istanbul, in modern Turkey. I'm standing right on the edge of Europe, too. That's Asia over there. Now, 800 years ago, from here to the Great Blue Sea was the most famous palace in the world. Its wealth, its beauty, its sacredness was the envy of people from Iceland to China. Only the angels in heaven, the Byzantines had said, knew the date of the ending of this dazzling city, the capital of the Empire of Byzantium, which they called Constantinople. Late in the Middle Ages, though, in the last two centuries of Byzantium, when the Crusaders had half destroyed the city and with the armies of the Turkish sultans closing in upon its walls, you didn't need to be an angel to know the end was very close the broken empire of Byzantium prepared to face its destiny. The emperors moved their palace here to Vlachanai, right on the city walls. Here they could face all their enemies, the Turks, the Westerners. Here too was a great church and a most sinister prison where half a dozen emperors were executed or blinded in terrifying family feuds. Just like the emperors, Jesus, Mary and all the saints had also moved out onto the city walls. This is the great monastery church of Saint Saviour in Cora, Saint Saviour in the fields. In the last centuries of Byzantium, the city's greatest icons were in this church, waiting to be paraded round the walls in times of siege. St. Saviour's was Byzantium's last masterwork, a jewel box set beside the city walls. Inside these little city churches, many people found their individual answers to the most terrible dilemma that any culture has to face, the threat of annihilation, of the death of a nation. The imperial crown was stored here, alongside the holy pictures. It's said that on the last night of Byzantium, on the 28th of May, 1453, as the Emperor Constantine Paleologus was praying, the Virgin Mary came down from heaven and asked him to return the crown to her, 
as God withdrew protection from his holy city. Above the door in shining gold, an image of the church's greatest benefactor, Theodore Metachites, Prime Minister and High Chancellor of Byzantium. Look at him with his turban and his caftan. The very model of an Eastern gentleman. Yet Theodore and the Byzantines were a very ancient people the living remnants of the world of Greece and Rome. Even by Theodore's day though, by the 1320s, the great chancellor had come to the conclusion that Byzantium's ancient heritage was quite exhausted. That all one really had to do was to wait and pray and silently endure. His church is a meditation on eternity. Theodore's artists have given us one of Byzantium's finest images, perhaps one of the greatest paintings ever made. I say that because it's a painting about humanity, about the value of humankind. Look what's going on. That's Christ in the middle, resplendent white. He's burst through the gates of hell. He's got the hands of Adam and Eve, that's all of us, and he's pulling them from the grave. It's the hands. Look at the hands. It's the hands that's got the urgency in them. The hands that are insisting upon this resurrection, not from earthly empires, but from the value of humankind itself. It was those ideals that drove Byzantium in his final years. The idea that like the kingdom of heaven, Byzantium was not a kingdom of this world. It was a belief in the inevitability that the world came, had a beginning and would come to an end. So when the emperor went onto the walls and took with him the most ancient icons of his faith and knew that he would die, he also knew that he was right. Many Byzantines believed that if an enemy ever broke through these vast old city walls, the very statues of the ancient emperors would come alive and drive the invaders from the city. For them, Constantinople was a sacred city, the center of the world, inviolable. Yet they too could see the Turkish armies drawing ever closer and their ancient city descending into ruin. By the 1400s, many of Byzantium's brightest minds had left the gathering gloom and darkness of the crumbling city and settled in a fresh new town beneath the mountain tops of southern Greece. A sparkling town on a hilltop close to the ruins of ancient Sparta, a town called Mistra. A miniature kingdom ruled by the emperor's brother Theodore and Queen Cleope, his Italian wife, where Jews and Greeks, Byzantines and Italians, Greek and Latins could live happily together. One of the lovely things about Mistra is how small it is, how tiny, how human. Everything here is democratic. As you walk down the street, you'd have bumped into everybody. You might have seen Italian merchants. You might have seen beautiful Queen Cleope walking amongst the flowers. And you might have seen the retired Emperor John here to visit his family, now a monk buzzing busily from church to church. At the hub of Mistra's life was a charismatic teacher from Constantinople, a follower of Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher, a man called Plethon. In Plethon's time, Mistra was already famous. It was a little paradise, they said. The men were handsome, the women were beautiful, and the stones were from ancient Sparta itself. 
but everybody knew that they were doomed. Here, Plethon founded the last academy of Greek philosophy. Here, he taught future patriarchs of Constantinople and future cardinals of the Church of Rome as well. As they mingled with the philosophers of late Byzantium, for a brief while, Western visitors to Mystra witnessed the last flowering of the living world of ancient Greece. This is the estate of a grand Byzantine nobleman. Not much left of the garden, just a few wild herbs and a little spinach. But you know, Plethon must have lived in a house like this. It really corresponds to the old philosopher's way of thinking about things. Upstairs, the noble family. Downstairs, the servants and the animals. The third class would have been the merchant classes. Lived in a bit of a smaller house. But this, this is grand. Look at the fireplace. Great big flue going up through the wood ceiling and the tiles to the outside. Just like a modern fireplace with a big canopy coming down the front. Those two holes there supporting the wood that held the cooking chain would have hung right down there with a big pot on it with two great stones underneath. Everything was cooked there. If they wanted to roast anything, they'd send it out to a local bread oven. Now, all the rest of the activity of this house went on in one big room. What you've got to think of here is little cubicles with curtains around the lavatory, the beds, any little private areas that people wanted. This was a very simple life because these were the leading men of Byzantium. Plethon was very proud of it. He said that even great Queen Cleope herself, who would have lived in a house like this, actually had given up the soft and decadent ways of the Italians and taken up our own innocent behaviour, he said. So you've got to think, old Plethon, sitting perhaps in the evening light, looking out over the Vale of Sparta, what would he have done? Well, he scribbled letters to the Duke. Plethon was very worried about the condition of Byzantium. He thought the world needed reformation and he came up with all these amazing ideas from ancient Greece. He was a bit of an old fascist really. A lot of his ideas were terrible but he was a magnetic character. People loved him. Like all professors, they loved listening to him and didn't take a word of notice of what he said. 